thank you, Jeremy and uh, Greg, for including me. So uh, I was asked to talk about psychomotor ability and how we enhance this through technology. And being a surgeon, I'm going to focus on that. As a surgeon, I love kind of gory operative uh, pictures. I'm going to spare you for most of those. But if you have an aversion to that, um, I'll try to warn you in case you want to close your eyes or something. Um, but these are my disclosures, just some research uh, grants uh, relative to education and training. So what I'd like you to do is just picture yourself in the steady hand of a surgeon, and you're the surgeon, and you are reaching for the grasp, for the scalpel, and you can feel it in your hand, um, feel the weight of the handle in your hand. It's not too light where it will slip. It's not too heavy where it will affect your balance. And, um, and so that you can exact, uh, uh, exercise that exact control to make that incision on the patient's skin. And so as the fine edge of that steel meets, meets the skin, you feel that resistance back in your hand, and you can make an adjustment so that you can exert the right pressure and make exactly the incision that you intend to make. And these are some of these things that happen in the operating room. Um, now imagine you're dissecting out a vessel. Um, in the, oh, I'm off kilter. Sorry, we're working. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, now imagine you're dissecting out a vessel, and you can see uh, this thin drape of almost uh, clear tissue kind of tethering it against this uh, thin-walled, large vein. And you know that it's very thin. You could just go right through it. Uh, but if you did, in your mind, you know that you can actually cause a traction injury in that vein and cause bleeding. And so even without realizing that your mind is making these calculations with each move, um, calculating the risk, you just adjust the movements and avoid this injury. Um, another example, you're in the operating room and you're about to remove a colon cancer, an obstructing colon cancer for a patient. And you want to see if there's any spread of that disease. And so you reach up to feel the liver. And even before you can see it, you feel this uh, spongy, sort of irregular texture, mass, two centimeter mass. But without even looking at it, you know that it's likely a spongy benign hemangioma, not a spread of a cancer. So the surgeon uses all of these informations from the senses to provide um, some information back to you on how to care for the patient, like the color of the intestines, is it viable or not, like connecting loops of intestine together, the subtle movement of the ureter to help identify it to keep it out of harm's way, the temperature of the patient, um, the sound of the pulse oximeter to know that your patient is still um, fine. Now put yourself here, a darkened room. Um, and then in this controlled chaos of mental invasive surgery, and this is the realm of surgery in which I operate. Um, so this technique uh, provides a lot of benefit to the patients, which I'll um, share later, but potentially it's more taxing to the surgeon. There's more noise, it's darker. There's a lot of technology that can help you, but it can also fail you, particularly if it's not designed well. And, uh, and you're displaced from the patient. You're feeling the patient through your instruments, um, in robotic surgery, you're not feeling it at all because our current robotic uh, technology that's available doesn't provide haptic feedback. And you're not directly um, looking at the tissues um, uh, through your eyes, right in your hands of the patient, but more displaced on a 2D screen, typically. And so there's some limit limitations. And we've had to adjust this te new technology in various ways that affect our psychomotor um, uh, skills and ability. For instance, if we're doing a splenectomy, um, often this is the uh, camera setup, where the camera here is located out, um, um, in my case, outside my non-dominant hand, which is a very confusing thing to be. If this is the first uh, your time at it, it's like having your eyes beside your head um, when you're looking, but this is the way that we operate. And there's a lot of different technology that we use in mental invasive surgery, and so we have to utilize other senses um, to do this. And sometimes technology helps us in this way, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, for example, this is a pedal for electric pottery device that we use. Um, in some cases, this is coded, so this, is, this side is yellow and this side is blue, but you're not looking at your feet. You're looking at the screen as you operate. But they make different sounds, and so we use the sounds to help monitor to make sure that we're pressing on the right side, or if I hear that sound and no one should be pressing on it, like the medical student, then I can say, okay, stop. Um, you know, in this uh, device with, the, um, uh, with an ultrasonic dissector tool that we use, each button has a different sound. And um, with a stapler, we also, um, 
We also use this technology to, um, I listen for the sound to see if the uh, load that I picked is the right um, depth and height for the tissue that I'm dividing. Um, it's interesting to me that the technology of Menelaus' surgery was really predicted a long time ago in the 1700s by John Hunter. So he's a British uh, surgeon, famous surgeon and anatomist pathologist, and who predicted this. And it wasn't until um, almost two centuries later when this was really adopted by gynecologists and then later in the 1980s by general surgeons with the advent of the removal of the gallbladder laparoscopically. Um, that this really came to fruition. And it's improved patient care in many ways, undergoing a variety of uh, procedures. Um, for instance, uh, this is associated, for the most part, for shorter hospital stay. Um, it's found to be equivalent in the treatment of colon cancer. And in fact, for stage three colon cancer, there's some benefit because of the decreased inflammation that laparoscopy provides, a lower risk of infection typically, and less pain, uh, shorter recovery for the patient, uh, greater precision. Um, we also use this, for instance, in um, gastric bypass surgery, weight loss surgery, where it's really tremendously dropped the morbidity and mortality for this procedure, so it's less than 1% to have a leak or a death rate related to this, um, far less than 1% um, in, most, in most institutions. Um, but it came with some caveats. So by the early 1992, uh, 81% of the surgeons had adopted a laparoscopic approach to gallbladder disease. Um, and there's this rise in elective uh, gallbladder removal. As you can see, this is data um, from Maryland, actually. And you can see this rise in laparoscopic cases, of removal of the gallbladder, and a decline in open. But overall, actually, um, that um, number of the people undergoing gallbladder surgery went up altogether. And so there are some people who are probably holding back and some younger patients who didn't want to have the big incision surgery who now are getting relief from their pain. Um, but it did come at some cost. When we look uh, back at this um, era, um, only half of the practicing surgeons, even though the majority of surgeons had adopted this um, technique, um, you'll uh, see that less than half of them were actually undergoing the required um, recommended training for it um, by our laparoscopic society. And this resulted in less morbidity, fewer deaths, but there's actually a higher incidence of bile duct injury. Now, albeit that's low, it's less than half of a percent, but it's still persistently higher than open surgery. So there's some um, uh, downside to this uh, technology. And so if we look, here's where some of the pictures come into play. Um, if we look at uh, gallbladder uh, disease, um, part of this uh, contribution to this injury is that it's a different perception. Rather than looking at it directly, you're looking at it through a camera, and the view is also different, where you're raising the gallbladder up and retracting the gallbladder a certain way, and, um, and it can be unfamiliar. The anatomy is also different. It's variable, um, like the artery might be in front of the duct, as I'm shown here, or there could be a... Um, a large uh, stone in the neck of the gallbladder that can affect the inflammation around it or the anatomy. And um, as you can see in this uh, uh, video here, if we just looked at it up front, you might think that this is actually the duct to the gallbladder, but in fact, this is actually the main um, duct uh, toward the liver. And so if you're not careful, if you're not, uh, if you don't know or not perceiving this difference in anatomy and this different view, then you could cause a major um, injury to the bile duct, which in some cases could really um, commit somebody to uh, significant liver surgery or even transplant. So we use technology to enhance our cells and our abilities in the OR, such as using ultrasound um, to help I um, identify the anatomy more clearly. And uh, there's newer technology as well. For instance, uh, this is a uh, technology that's available from Novadac, um, which, which is partnered with Stryker. And uh, this uses endocyanin green. Uh, this absorbs light in the near-infrared region, also emits fluorescence at a certain lower uh, wavelength as well. And it's approved, in, in my case particularly, for hepatic function and blood flow, among other um, causes. So it binds to plasma proteins and it's confined to the intravascular compartment. There's a limited leak in the interstitium. And, um, and so the technology will show uh, different views. And so if we want to really identify where the bile duct is, we can see this. And if you look at these pictures, it shows some different applications of it. So this can be used in colon resection to check the viability of uh, tissue as that colon is being put together. Um, if this isn't viable at the edge, then you can get a breakdown and patient can become septic, severely ill from that. 
in gallbladder, as I mentioned, and it shows simultaneously three different views, sort of the normal laparoscopic view, this um, white image, black, white view, and then uh, where the bile is actually um, shown green, and, and you can adjust this um, picture as well. And it's also used in esophagectomy, again, an important area where it's important to know the viability um, of the uh, resection margin. So here's a uh, photo from the uh, gallbladder surgery. You can see sort of the normal, and I'll just scroll through this. You can start to see a little bit of green over here, and this is the bile ducts. And you'll see two sort of lines of green. It's hard for me to see the glare there, but basically um, the one to the farther right is actually a common bile duct, and the one to the left is, is the duct that you are fine to take, which is the bile duct to the liver. And you can see now it's even uh, lighted up more as time passes, um, where you can see. Um, and highlight that to try to keep you out of harm's way and the patients out of harm's way. Um, robotic surgery is another advance, and this can enhance the surgeon in many ways. Um, so it provides 3D vision as opposed to the 2D vision laparoscopy. It's surgeon control, and it's really immersive. Um, you put your head right into the console, and you can see everything in up to a 10 times magnified view. It also, as a post-laparoscopy, gives you a lot of degrees of freedom, so it mimics more what your hands and wrists can do in real life and in surgery. Um, but it also uh, is scalable, so it scales down uh, your movements, and so it's more precise. It can help uh, um, uh, minimize a tremor that a surgeon might have in the operating room, which, as you can imagine, would be an important thing to have. And, um, and so it does this tremor filtration as well. Uh, but there is a downside to that. Um, as I mentioned, in their most common platform, there's no haptic feedback. And, um, and so in the robotic arms can be very powerful. And so you could pull on something, break suture, you could tear something if you're not um, mindful of it. And so you have to use these other um, senses uh, that, you're, that you have in terms of visual cues um, to guide you. It also is a very focused field of view. That's a benefit where you can really zoom in on something very closely, but it's also a risk because then you don't really know what's happening outside of your field of view. And you're very displaced from the bedside, so you rely on assistance at the bedside. You have total control of your instruments, but somebody's at the bedside you have to rely on to change the instruments and so forth, and then it can be costly as well. Um, so how do we address these limitations? Um, we know that there are some lessons that we've learned from the gallbladder um, era, and that is that we really have to rely as well on training and simulation. So this is another area where I use technology to help advance patient care. Um, this is a, a photo from our um, lab upstairs in uh, Mystics, our Minimal Invasive Surgery Training and Innovation uh, Center, um, where our residents train every week. Um, we also uh, work with industry, we work with our um, engineering partners to develop um, um, training modalities uh, for patients, training in laparoscopy and robotics, and also to improve technology. Um, there is uh, also, we know that surgeons are limited by what we can see. And in the OR here, as well as in many other centers, Duke and at Dartmouth, um, a lot of imaging is brought into the operating room. So it's combined, so you can actually image patients as you're operating on them to help uh, localize tumors, for instance. Um, this is actually a facility at um, Dartmouth where I was uh, before in faculty, um, the Center for Surgical Innovation. And what's unique about this is that it's actually outside of the operating room. So you can uh, book surgery there. But it's also primarily designed as well as a research facility. And you can see here on the side is kind of a debrief kind of uh, theater where you can observe and you can look at the systems and how people work together and also um, imaging. And this has MRI, CT scan, and it's actually a functional operating room. Um, so in conclusion, these advances technology really enhan enhances the vision of the surgeons and can enhance precision. Um, which can be to the benefit of the patient in terms of lessening the physiologic impact and trauma to the patient. Um, but also this new technology requires additional training and awareness of its limitations, and then probably other technology to address those limitations. So thank you very much.